we, we Jews have been waiting for 2,000 years. And if you look at history, for, for 2,000 years, Am Yisrael has been performing Torah and Mitzvahs, been doing a lot of good things. Always Torah and Mitzvahs is beautiful. But at the same time, as much as Am Yisrael was doing Torah and Mitzvahs, Am Yisrael also was always yearning for something greater, something that's going to just change the world. And every single day in davening, throughout, every, ever since we were taken out of Yerushalayim, we would scream and cry out, come back to Yerushalayim. That means we yearn for salvation all day long. We don't stop yearning for salvation. We don't all the time. We just, we want Mashiach. We're yearning, we're looking for Mashiach. And throughout the ages, it's been an animamin be'emun ha'shleim ha'baviyas ha'mashiach. And if you look, you know, when you associate the Holocaust, and you think about what were Jews doing in the Holocaust, you would find that they were either saying Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokein Hashem Echad, or they were saying Animam. When the Jew would go to the last, you know, Chas Shalom by the gas chambers, he would say Animam in Bemuna Shleim of Avias Hamashiach. I have a Muna. I I I I'm still on board. I know this is not it. Animam in Bemuna Shleim of Avias Hamashiach. And the question is. A, it's quite phenomenal how despite everything, despite all that happened, despite all that occurred, we're still here, still believing in Mashiach, still expecting him to come. That's that's quite incredible. But my question is, does it really help us? The fact that we've been having this emuna and believing, that, does it really, really help us? I, I can't help but bring up, you know, my my grandmother was an Ingarisha lady. She was... Um, she was from Sigit. And um, and she told me, she says, you know, Mashiach, he didn't come then. He's not coming. <laughs> He's not coming, you know. <laughs> and, and when someone went, goes out of Auschwitz, you don't argue with them. And you realize that, you know, hey, we went through Auschwitz. We went through the whole thing. And he didn't come. And he didn't come. So what makes you think he's coming now? But, you know, those of us who didn't go through Auschwitz, Baruch Hashem, can think with a different head slightly. And when we look at the, we say, we understand, and we say, look, so what does it mean? We still yearn for Mashiach. After all this time, we still believe 100% that Mashiach is coming. And the Animamin remains intact and powerful and more than ever, ever, ever before. But does it help? That's my question. Does it, does it help that you anticipate and yearn and are looking and are hoping for Mashiach to come. And if you don't, if you say, you know what, it's not happening, it doesn't make a difference to God, it doesn't make a difference to the world if you don't believe Mashiach is coming, if you don't have Emuna. Why is it so important that we sit down and we daven for it and we demand it? Does, does the demand actually play a part of the whole picture itself? And I take you back to a moment a very intense and powerful moment that takes place in history some uh, 3,000 or so years ago. The moment is recorded in two places in Tanakh, in Sefer Shmuel, Shmuel Aleph, and the same thing in Tehillim. And let me give you the background. So David Amelech was a young, boy, young guy, and um, he finds himself with Shaul Abelach. And unfortunately for him, Shaul had been admonished by the prophet, by Shmuel. He told him he was not going to be a king anymore. And um, David Abelach is going to, some, someone's going to replace you, he told him. Someone, I don't know who, but someone's going to replace you. So David is, no, it's like, it seems to be known. It becomes clearer and clearer when David kills Goliath. He kills Goliath. It becomes more and more obvious that he's going to be the one. And the girls are on, on the walls of, of, uh, of, your, of uh, walking on the walls over there. And they say, He killed the thousands and David killed tens of thousands. And so David Amalek is obviously going to be greater than Shaul. And all this is getting the jealousy of Shaul aroused at David Amalek. And then Doyeg Doimi deliberately, Doyeg was the Av Beisdin, he was the head of the Beisdin, and he deliberately walks over to David and he's to, to Shaul. And when he introduces David as the man who's going to kill Goliath, so he says to him, he says, 
I'll give you all the Giber Chayil and all the wonderful terms about him. And he says, Vahashem Imoy. Whatever he said about him, David said, Shaul knew, I can have it also. But Hashem Imoy means Halacha Kemoy, so Halacha follows him. And that was something that Shaul yearned for. He never got the Halacha Paskin like him. So Shaul was getting more and more and more jealous at David. And one day, Shaul, his, his, his anger is totally aroused. David was a little boy who was playing the harp in front of David. And Shaul takes his chanit, his, um, his uh, uh, lance, his spear, and he throws it at David and he almost kills him. David runs in the nick of time. And then in the series of events, David ends up marrying the daughter of Shaul. Shaul annuls the marriage. And David has to flee. She helps him flee. And David runs away. He finds himself in the desert of Yehuda, in Midbar Yehuda. And as he comes to Midbar Yehuda, he's running away. He thinks the people are going to be with him and he's going to be able to, to you know, survive this. So he comes to Midbar Yehuda and David and Sha- Shaul chases him. Now the Zifim, the Zifim were the people who lived in that area. They were Jewish people. And they went over to David and they... They went over to Shaul and they informed Shaul what David was actually up to. And they told Shaul, you should know that David is in such and such an area and hiding away. And once David, Shaul comes over and he tries to get him. And then he comes, the whole event that happened over there. I want to focus on the second time he comes. The second time, again, the people of Midbar Yehuda, the Zifim, went and informed Shaul where David was. And David was shocked that you're informing on me. You want to kill me. You think I'm the one who's wrong over here? And Shaul comes over and he's in the camp. And Avner Benner is the general of Shaul. And Avner is in charge of, uh, of the security forces of Shaul. And David notices from far, David and his men notice that Shaul has fallen asleep in the dark of night. A special tardema, a slumber of God fell upon him. So David decides that he's going to go together with one of his men. He says to his men, who wants to come with me? And Avishai, Avishai was the son of Surya. He was the brother of Yoyab ben Surya. Avishai says, I'll go with you, Your Majesty. Not Your Majesty, but he goes with him. And they enter into the camp and everybody's fast asleep, a miracle of God. And they walk over right next to Shaul. And Avishai says, let me just kill him, put him to death. And the whole thing's over and done and there's no more problems. And he says, don't you dare kill Mashiach Hashem. We're not touching. He's the anointed of God. He's Mashiach Hashem. And David says, instead, let's take his chanit, his spear, and let's take his tzapachas mayim, his negavasa shisl, his water next to his bed. And they take the water and they take the spear. And David goes away with Abishai and he goes to the other mountain. And then he screams out and he wakes them up. And he says, he says, do you guys realize what just happened? He says, Avner Bener, you're supposed to be the general. You're supposed to be in charge of the GSS, the General Security Forces. You're supposed to be watching out for His Majesty. Why are you not watching out for His Majesty? Do you realize what just happened? I entered into your camp and look what happened. He says, watch, I'll show you. And he takes out the spear and the water. And he says, you see, I was just there. Here's the proof. And he says, one of your boys can come in and take it out. But this is proof that I never wanted to kill Shaul. He says to Shaul, your majesty, I'm a devoted, dedicated servant. All I intended is good things. And why are you out to kill me? And Shaul looks at him and he says, you're right, my son. You are 100% correct. I'm in the wrong. You are 100% in the right. He says, my son, I swear from now on, I will be 100%. I, I appreciate you. I'm done. Now, David knows that he can't trust Shaul ever. He knows that um, Shaul, once in a while, every so often, he's in a good mood, and then he has a ruach, he had this evil spirit that would befall him. And when he had an evil spirit, you don't mess with Shaul. And he realized he wants to come back, but he cannot go back. And so he says to Shaul, I'm sorry, you go your way, I'll go my way. And he screams the following words. He says, and these are the powerful words he says, in the pasuk recorded in Shmuel Aleph, he says, you have kicked me out. You have ousted me from the from the, the the inheritance of God, and you've told me go serve idols. Now, what's what's he remarking? What's he explaining over here? What David was saying was that 
as the Gemara says, Kol Ador Bechutz Laaretz Keni She'ein Loi Eleika. The Gemara explains if someone lives outside <coughs> outside the land of Israel, it's as if he might as well consider he doesn't have a God. Now, just to point out technically, David was not outside the land of Israel. He was actually inside the land of Israel. But the difference is that he was, he, as the Mepharshim explained, the commentaries explain, that he says, um, I can't trust the Zifim anymore. I can't trust the people who reside in the desert of Yehuda. They are going to, to uh, deliver me into your hand. At some point, I'm going to be informed on again. And therefore, for the first time in my life now, I'm going to run out. I'm going to flee to Chutz Laaretz, outside Israel. And we know that the Gemara says, whoever lives outside Israel, it's as if he doesn't have a God. In fact, the Ramban says that in outside the land of Israel, it's only at Tzibilach Tziyunim. You only have to do, you don't really have to do mitzvahs. It's only like a child doing mitzvahs because uh, you're outside the land of Israel. The mitzvahs only apply inside the land. So David says, I'm, I'm going to be outside the land, and I'm going to be I'm going to I'm going to be forced away from the land of Israel, and he says, and not just that, but my problem is, my problem is that um, he says my issue is that you're forcing me outside the land of Israel, and you're forcing me to serve idols. Now, on a very basic level, he says, all I want, all I wish for, is to be present to be present by the Mishkan. There was no Yerushalayim at that point. I want to be in the Mishkan. I just want to be present and able to serve God next to the base Hamikdash. That's all I want. And there's beautiful, immortal words that David issues at that point. So now what we do is we move from the book of Shmuel to the book of Tehillim. Because there's two places where this whole thing happens, right? One is in Sefer Shmuel, Sefer Shmuel describes the story of what's going on. And Sefer Tehillim is the book that David writes and composes to express the feelings of his heart. David expresses how, you know, this is the story, this is what's going on, and this is what I feel as all this is happening. So when you look in Shmuel, you don't usually get in the book of Shmuel as much of an experience, a soulful experience, right? Every so often you have it, like let's say, the tefillah of Chana is a very soulful experience of Chana describing her, her heartfelt feelings. And David Abelach describes, he says, it is heartfelt. He says, You've kicked me out of being able to experience the inheritance of Hashem. Lamer to say, go, go serve other gods. Because through my inability to serve in there was no base on Mikdash in the Mishkan. I cannot be next to the Mishkan, and I'm going to go even further. I'm going to escape. I'm going to have to go outside the land of Israel. So I don't have the ability to serve God. And he says, I cannot forgive you for that. I can't forgive you for disabling my ability to serve Hashem in the base on Mikdash. And he says, in Tehillim, David expresses how he feels. So if you go to Tehillim, capital Samach Gimel. Kapitel Samach Gimel is chapter 63. And David says as follows. Now, this is the scene of what David's going through. As the story is unfolding, this is what David's feeling. He says, Elikim, my God, Kaylee, Abishta, my God, Atta Shachareko, I yearn for you. Tsoma Lechonafshi, my soul thirsts for you. Koma Lechonafshi, my whole Flesh of chalishing for you. I got goosebumps. Be'eretz tia ve'oyef in the land parched and thirst. Beli moim without any water. Kain ba'koidesh chazisicho halavai. I wish, I wish, I wish I could be present with you in the koidesh. Lira is to see uzchol chvedecho your might and your honor. So this warrior who's fearless, this fearless warrior who has no problem to go out and to go into, David, nice to see you, with the answer, who goes out into the field, right, has no problem to go out and to, to fight and to, to go daring in this maneuver into David Amalek, into Shaul. He expresses his heartfelt feelings and he says, you know what I feel? I feel that all I have is a land parched, a land thirsty without any water. Now, 
in those words, right? Those words, what, what, what appears to be happening over there is David is describing the feeling of what it means to be without, without God, without an ability to serve God. He's like, what's, what's life worth if I'm not able to serve Hashem? But I want to take you on a bit of a, a deeper understanding of David Amelech's his yearning and his quest and what he's truly looking for at this point. And here comes the question. When David Amelech is yearning for God, and when you and I are davening and we're saying, and we experience ourselves some kind of yearning and some kind of chalishing and wanting, God, I want to be with you. When you experience some kind of yearning, is there any... Is there any point to it? Does it make a difference in God's world if you do it or not? And how does a yearning work? And what should a person feel? How do you make a yearning something worthwhile? In 1957, Taf, Shin, Yud, Zayin. Welcome, Avrami. 1957, there was a fabrengan that took place by the Lubavitcher Rebbe, and it took place inside in 770. And the Rebbe addresses this question. And he addresses the question, he says, so David HaMelech is screaming, I'm yearning for you, I thirst for you, God. I want to be with you, Hashem. He says, as David is thirsting for God, there's something deeper going on under, under, under the picture. <clears throat> and he told the story. You know, the best way to explain anything is with a story. Here's the story. The story is that there was once a chassid in the days of the Balatanya. And this chassid, his name was Reb Shmuel Munkis. He was a, he was known as a, a shtifa, you know, like a, a shovav. He was a, a fun kind of guy. He's a comedian. He always made things fun, but he was really a huge Talmud Chacham, a real scholar, a real chassid, a great genius and, a, and an incredible person. And he describes the scene where this Rav Shmuel Munkus, who was not a chassid at the time, finds, finds himself, he's looking for a rebbe, he's looking for a, a mentor, he's looking for a guide, he's looking for a rebbe. And the moment that the Rav Shmuel Munkus meets the Balatanya, so he travels all the way to Liazna because he hears the Balatanyans over there. He wants to meet him in Liazna. He travels all the way comes into the city, it's late at night. When he entered, it was a dark, cold, freezing Russian night. The Russians know how to make the nights freezing. Night is frozen cold. And he comes in and um, he's looking for a place to sleep. Now every house, the whole town, every single house is, uh, is dark. Everybody, Allah Shlaf and everybody's sleeping late at night. So he's like, okay, what do we do? We have to find a house that has light in it. And he figures, you know what? The one house that's going to have a light in it, the only one house going to have a light. It's late at night, right? Surely, if I'm looking for a Rebbe, the Rebbe, that's the Balatanya, must be learning Torah now. It can't be that he's not learning Torah. So therefore, the light's going to be on. So he's looking up and down and up and down, looking throughout the city, and he's trying to find in Liozna, where do I find the a light? And finally, in a little, tiny little house, he sees the light. And he travels and he walks over to this house through the snow. He's freezing outside. He, mama, she's walking with his coat and he's like shivering as he gets in. It's two o'clock in the morning. And he comes to the door and he daringly knocks on the door, puts a knock on the door. And he knocks and he knocks. And everybody in the house is sleeping. And the only one who's awake is the Balatanya himself. And the Rebbe opens the door. Now, this is the first meeting between Rebbe and Chassid. So the Balatanya is standing inside the house. And the Chassid of Shmuel is outside the house. He's in the freezing cold. The Balatanya is inside and it's warm in the house. He says, yes, who are you? He says, I'm a Jew. And I'm looking for a place to stay. I'm, uh, it's freezing outside. I need a place to stay. He said, so why'd you come here? The Rebbe tells him. He says, well, I needed 
I'm looking for a Yiddish shtub. He says, there's many Jewish homes around town. Why would you come here? So he tells them, because this is also a Jewish home. And I saw a light over here. This is a Jewish home. So I decided I'm going to come into this Jewish home. And here I am. He says, you're looking for a Jewish home? I have, the Rebbe tells him, I have a Goy. I have my Gentile. And I'm going to call my Goy. And I'm going to tell my Goy to kick you out of here. So Shmuel is a ghost. He says, the Rebbe, I'm coming to the Rebbe. And the Rebbe is telling me that he's going to kick me out of here. The Rebbe is telling me that. So he looks at the Rebbe. And he says, Rebbe, mine goy is greser vi ayer goy. He says, Rebbe, my goy is bigger than your goy, is stronger than your goy. Sorry, stronger than your goy. And my goy is going to kick your goy right out. And the Rebbe says, ah, 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 if that's the case, I'm coming. This, and this is the, the moment that the Shmuel Munkas becomes a chassid. Shmuel Munkas in that moment became a chassid of the Balatanya. Now, the story was told by the Rebbe Rayatz. And in the Fabrang, when the Rebbe tells a story, he says, you know, every story, every story is special, but a story whereby a chassid meets his Rebbe for the first time has to have some real depth to it. And has to have a real a real insight into explaining to us. Because, look, the Balatanya, you know what the Balatanya was? If you read the teaching of the Balatanya, seriously, it is, it is extraordinary to find a, a Rebbe who has, you know, on the one hand, the Balatanya has this incredible ability to, to take you on a, on, a, on a trip into Kabbalistic insights and, 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 and just you lose it completely. You discover a, a holiness, a kedusha. When you learn Tanya, or Likute Teira, it is unreal. And at the same time, he writes a Shulchan Aruch Harav, and he writes Shaila Sechuvas. So this, this tzaddik of a man who's able to rise up in the holy world is also able to explain to you pilpulim on every detail of, 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 a, of a halacha. And he carries both together, the holy spiritual together with the nigla, the revealed side of Torah. When the Balatanya would daven, his room was padded. They put a padding all over his room. And the reason was because he would never, he wasn't able to stay still when he davened. So as he would daven, he would jump and he would thrash from side to side, from one side to the other, in such a dvekus, in a state of total dvekus, of total communion with the divine. The Balatanya was, was you know, it's really the level of a novi. When you look at what, what Naveem felt, Naveem, it says, was a Navi was a meshuga. A Navi would, would remove his garments, he would take off his garments, and he would, he, would, he would get into a whole state, a complete divine, holy state. That's where a Navi would go, a prophet. And the Balatanya was literally on such a level. And here you have this chassid, this regular Jew, who says, I want to be a part of this. And I'm ready to completely dedicate my life to the mission of of discovering my inner being and connecting my soul with your soul. So the moment of their meeting is a moment that can be studied and focused and learned and understood. And it's something we all can learn from. And here's the message. So let's go through the details of the story as recounted to us and you see how those details have an application in our lives. So Rav Shmuel Munkis is looking for the Balatanya and it's a dark, cold, freezing night. That's all of us. We're in a state of a freezing cold life. And we're looking for God. And we're looking for something real. Much like David Amelech is in a state of nafshi. I'm yearning for you, God. I'm thirsting. I'm yearning for the Abishta. God help me. Nafshi. Sorry. And as he's yearning for God, he comes in and he says. One thing I know, I don't know what I'm looking for, but I know one thing and one thing only, that I need light in my life and I need to go where light is. And light is going to be in the Balatanya's home. You know, take a look at us, right? When there's a state of a corona state 
and we're all locked up and wondering and trying to find something deeper and more real in our lives. And it's like, okay, where do we go? So what, what do you miss? What do you miss when you're living in a state of Corona, right? What, what do you miss now? So it's like, oh, I miss going to the sports games. I miss being able to have, uh, you know, um, my friends over. I miss going out to, to a restaurant at night. I miss a whole lot of wonderful things. But a Jew knows that what I really miss most. And in fact, as long as I'm focused on that, what I really miss is why can't I daven together with others? And it's not the kiddush that I'm looking for. It's not the camaraderie that I'm looking for. It's, hey, God, I daven today and there was no birkas koyanim. There was no koyanim. I didn't hear the brach of a koyan. I didn't hear a koyan say, Ah, yeah, 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 an expression, an experience, and a connection to Hashem is Baruch. That's what I want. So I'm looking for the light. The first thing is to know what to look for when you're in a state of, of, of searching. What is it that we should be looking for? Yeah, what should I be looking for? I should be looking for God. I should be looking for an ability to be connected, to be attached to the Rabbi Nishalayla, to be attached to God. That's number one. So the Rav Shmuel Munkis comes over and he gets to the home of the Balatanya. There he is. He's standing outside the home, and now he's saying, okay, so I want to get back in. So the chassid stands outside, the yitz, the Jew stands outside, and he says, God, why did you take this? Why exactly did you take away? What did I do wrong? What did I do wrong that I shouldn't deserve to daven with a minion? And what did I do wrong that I shouldn't deserve to have a birkas koyanim? And what did I do wrong that I shouldn't deserve to have an ability to go to mikveh? For Shri Shal Pesach, for Achron Shal Pesach, do I really deserve this, O oh God Almighty? And the Chas is standing outside the room and he says, Rebbe, all I want is I want to get in. Please just let me in. Let me into your home. And the Rebbe looks at him and he says, you're expecting to get into my house? You think? You think you have the right to get in? By what right do you ask to get in? Are you making an assumption that just because, so you deserve to daven with a minion? And just because, so therefore what? Therefore you deserve to hear Birkas Koyanim. Do you realize it's a privilege? All these years which you were living life, you were privileged to be able to daven and to have the holiness and to go to mikveh and to have all the wonderful things around. But perhaps, just perhaps, you took it for granted. Perhaps. So the rabbi looks at him and he says, he says, why are you looking for my house? So he says, it's a, it's a Jewish house. What do you mean? Why shouldn't I look? That's what I want. I want to get to a Jewish house. And the Alter Rebbe, the Balatanya, tells him, he says, I'm going to call the Goy, and the Goy is going to kick you out. The Goy is going to kick you out of the house. What does it mean? Why is the Goy going to kick you out of the house? Because every one of us, inside our beings, we have a Goy. You know who the Goy is? David Amelech himself explains in his soul. He says, I'll tell you what the Goy is. In Hallel, which we also didn't have a minion for. In Hallel today, we said, I call God from distress. God answers me. And he gives me the Merchav, the, um, the wide expanse living. But then David HaMelech says, King David says, Kol goyim sevavuni Hashem ki amilam. All the goyim have surrounded me. So when you look and you say, what goyim are surrounding you? What does it mean the goyim are surrounding me? There's no goyim surrounding you. Are you and I surrounded by goyim? Actually, the goyim are wonderful people. Says the Balatanya, the goyim are the goyim inside of you. The goyim is the animal soul, the body, the goof, and the nefesh is inside of us. And the goof and nefesh abamis refuse to allow us to connect. The goof and nefesh abahamis prevent a Jew from binding himself to God, the body and the animal soul. So I'm trying to connect. I want to go to shul. 
my body wants to talk to the guy next to me, comes to shul, wants to have the kiddush, all the wonderful things out of me. My body's not interested. My animal soul is not interested in following the whole system. So the rabbi looks at the chassid and he says, I understand you want to come into the house. You want to get in. But why do you want to get in? I'm going to tell the goy, which goy? The goy inside you. I'm going to tell the goy to get rid of you. Don't assume, don't make any assumption that you can just get in. It's got to be earned. It's got to be something special. You know, a, a couple of weeks ago, there was a, a WhatsApp voice note that went out. And it was some guy, um, beautiful, very moving, a very moving WhatsApp note. Some of them make it, you know, to a higher level. So he was talking for about half an hour. He says, my dear children. And he goes through and he describes what it was, what happened in Corona. And he says, guys, you know what happened? We used to have weddings and the point of the weddings was the show. And we used to have shuls and the point was just the, uh, the kiddush clubs. And, and he goes through all the things we had. He says, did we really care about God? And that's why God took it away from us. And it's the whole rebuke, the whole, a whole half hour of rebuke. So then I heard someone else sent another WhatsApp voice note, which also went around. And this guy goes back and he says, how dare you speak badly about Jews? Is that what you think about Jews? He says, do you realize how much goodness Jews are doing? How much good? What Hatzalah, what is Hatzalah? Hatzalah is a bunch of people who are ready to go day and night and give up on everything they do just to go out. To help a fellow Jew, how much tzedakah, how much charity is being given, more than you could ever, ever imagine. The amount of charity being given is unreal and insanely beautiful. How much chesed, how much kindness is being done? It's all being done by Jews. How dare you speak badly about Jews in that sense? And I was looking at this and I was thinking, you know, back in the days of the Rambam, the Rambam was upset with a certain chacham, a certain um, rabbi, who admonished the people in North Africa. Those guys in North Africa, they, they, uh, they gave up their religion because the Muslims forced them to give up their religion. So the guy writes and he says, he told them that you guys are all, you're out. Basically, God doesn't love you anymore. God doesn't care for you because you have given up on his faith. And even though you're doing it in secret, you still believe he says God doesn't care for you anymore. And the Rambam tells him, how dare you speak badly about Jews? How dare anyone speak badly about Jews? These are holy, holy Jews. So I was looking, I was saying, is that the same case over here where one guy is saying Jews are good, one guy is saying Jews are not? The difference is that the Rambam was talking to others. The Rambam says, don't speak badly about others. You have no right. Don't you dare speak badly about Jews. But when each one of us is looking at himself, when each one of us is thinking about his own self, so then maybe we should look into ourselves and say, do we deserve to go back into the shul? What do we deserve? So that's what David HaMelech says. King David says, Kol goyim sevavuni. My own goyim have surrounded me. I need to look into myself. If I'm looking at you, you're a holy Jew, you're a tzaddik, everything you're doing is absolutely phenomenal and amazing, and you deserve all the best in the world. But if I'm looking at my own self, and I want to know about myself, I got to ask myself the question, what is demanded of me? And to this end, the chassid stands in front of the Rebbe, and he's asking to be let in. And the Rebbe looks at him, and he says, the goy is not letting you in. Between me and you is a goy, your goy, your animalistic soul. What do you really and truly care about? Do you care about God or do you care about yourself? What do you truly care about? Why do you want to go back to shul? Has it got anything to do with God? What's wrong with davening at home? It's so beautiful to daven at home. You can actually get into a state of his You can get into a state of communion with God. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. So what's so bad about it? What's so wrong? And the Jew looks and he says... I'm not sure, Rebbe. I'm not sure, but something, something, Rebbe. And Rebbe Shmuel looks and he says, Rebbe, my goy is starker, the ayah goy. He says, my goy is stronger, more powerful than your goy. 
This is the point of teshuva that a Jew gets to. It's the point of return to God. And suddenly he realizes that my goy is greater than your goy. He looks inside and he says, oh my gosh, look at my midos, look at my emotions. What am I like? What kind of person am I? Yeah, I dabble with a minion all the time, but I go to work and I get angry and scream at all the people around me. That's my goy inside me. I find myself, oh, yeah, I, I, I dab and I learn, but I'm also addicted to everything under the sun. And where is the yid inside me? Where's the Jew inside me? And he says, if you want to get back in, if you want a relationship between a chassid and a rebbe, if a Jew wants a relationship with God, it's going to have to be different. And the way to do it is you got to get rid of the goy inside you. You got to build a relationship, a Jewish relationship between us and God. And that's what David Amelech says. David Amelech says, Samo nafshi lelikim, Samo lecho nafshi, Koma lecho besari, God, my soul thirsts for you. I'm yearning for you. All I want is to be attached to God. And when you wonder, what does that help? What it helps is that each one of us has inside of us a goy. And it's not just a mere yearning. To be able to yearn for God is itself a gift from Hashem. It's a gift from Hashem to be able to yearn. It means you overcame your goy inside you. I was sitting by Mashiach Suda and I was singing the nigan of the Balatanya. And I got to tell you, all I could think about was one thing. I was saying to myself, God Almighty, help me to be able to want and to crave Mashiach for real. I'm saying the words. I'm saying, I'm saying it, yes. But do I believe it? Do I really feel that do I, do I have? Is there any part of me that actually wants God? And I daven, I said, God Almighty. You know, it's like it says, the Baal Shem Tov says the explanation. The simple meaning in, in capital 102 in Tehillim is, it's feel of a poor man when he, when he wraps himself up and he says, he davens Hashem, I'm davening to you. So the Baal Shem Tov says, the tefillah of the Oni is, Hashem God, help me to be able to pray to you. All I want is to be able to daven to Hashem. God, help me to be able to daven to you. I don't know why, God. I want to go back into Shul, but I don't know if I want Mashiach. I don't know if I care for Mashiach. I don't know if I really am interested in it. If you want to go back in, God says, if you want to really go back in, what we need over here is a brand new experience to figure, to realize that Corona is not because of me. No, no, I don't know why it is. But the fact is that if there is a Corona now, what is it? It beckons me to say that nothing in the world happens. No Jew has ever been able to be affected by a Goy ever in history. There is nothing. There is no power that a Goy can ever have over a Jew. A Goy has zero power over a Jew. And the only reason that a Jew gets exiled and goes out is for one reason only. The only reason is because I allowed him in and I succumbed to my own Yetzirah. And the time now is to work on ourselves and to look into our own beings and to say, who am I really? Who am I truly? I want to go daven with the minion. In order to go daven with the minion, get rid of the goy inside me. Who's the goy inside me? The one who gets upset at my wife, at my spouse, the one who gets angry at my fellow people, the other one who gets depressed and down and to work on that. And how do you do that? That itself is you turn to the Amish and you say, God, help. I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to overcome my midos, but I know that I want to be with you. And to be with God is not just to be davening in shul with a minion. To be with God is to be in an experience of oneness with Hashem that we never had before in history. And if we're sitting outside shul and we're being forced outside the shul, we're not looking to get back into shul. We're looking to get back into a relationship with God that we never knew we had before. And so the story of Shmuel Munkas and the Balatanya from beginning to end is a story of every one of our neshamas. Initially, it's cold, it's freezing. And one thing you have to know is know where to look. Look, look for the right thing. You want to, don't look, for, I don't want the sports and the kiddush club, none of that. I want, at least I want to be with God. 
But then the Rebbe tells him, he says, you have no right to get in here because you have a goy inside you. And he says, Rebbe, but my goy is so much stronger than any other goy. My goy is the strongest of all. And let me in anyway. And that realization, the very realization that my goy is so strong, the very realization that I'm so distant from you, God, that itself is exactly what allows me to get in to a relationship with God. And so the Baal Shem Tov has the most incredible explanation of this word. The Baal Shem Tov says, and by the way, in our shul now, we just put a new parochas up. I was there, but uh, no one else has been there yet, I don't think. And on the parochas, there's a beautiful image of the Beis HaMikdash. Just went up before Pesach. And there are three words that says there. And the words are, Kein Bakoidesh Chazisicha. Kein Bakoidesh Chazisicha means, Halavai, I wish I could sense you in the Kodesh. And the simple meaning is, I'm yearning, I'm thirsting for God. I have nothing to show. I wish I could be with you. But the Baal Shem Tov says, there's something greater that you could never imagine. The words came, mean, Halavai, I wish that when I was in the Kodesh, I would be able to see you like this. For those who are saying, ah, I wish I could have a Birkas Koenim, I wish I could dab and I wish I could be all that. So the Baal Shem Tov says that when you say, King Bakoidesh Chazisicha, you should know that the desire to be back in the Koidesh, that itself is greater than anything else. Kain Bakoidesh Chazisicha. When a person says, I wish, I wish, I wish, all I wish is that I could be back davening with the Eidishter. And then, and then he says, but, but why, why do I deserve it? And then he looks deeper inside himself and he says, I got to overcome my own Yetzirah. I got to overcome my own connection to God. And that, Kain Bakoidish Chazisicha, that is more dear and more precious to Hashem than anything else. Never, ever ensure what we like or we can be now. And that's the Kain Bakoidish Chazisicha. Not, I wish I could be in the Koidish, but rather, the Koidish wishes it could be in me. The Beis Amikdash. Wishes all those who in Shul wish they could daven like a Jew davens today, and he says, I wish I could be a Birkas Kayani. But ah, the only way to get out of it is one way out, and that is, and that is that we, we, we're not looking to be back in the same place we were before, it'll be pointless. We're looking to be in a relationship with God, and all that is dependent on each one of us to realize it's the goy inside you. And when you look inside your own goy, and then you're able to accomplish, then you're able to get to a deeper place. So what I want to do now is, even though Zoom doesn't really do it well, but let's try anyway. Let's sing together the Nigan Tzam of Hanafshi. Whoever wants can unmute themselves so we can hear a couple of voices. The problem is everyone just hears a whole balagan, but whatever, make it work. And let's sing together the Tzam of Hanafshi. And as we do, let's look at a yearning for God. Let's realize yeah, this is what I want. I want nothing more. I want nothing more than to be bound to God in a relationship with the Almighty. You can't answer, really. Yeah. And if I don't want it, then I want to want it. Let's go. Oh, yet some Yeah, I could be there. I'm 
where I'm completely in a desert and I can't see God. I have no relationship with God whatsoever. He says, this Midbar is a Midbar of Yehuda. This Midbar is a place where you find God, which means if we're looking, if we're realizing that God is everywhere, if God is really and truly everywhere. So what's everywhere? Everywhere means he's in Shul and he's also in Corona. He's also right there, everywhere, every place where you go, you're attached to God. And so, David says, when I was in a, in, a, in a desert, the desert means I'm a place where there's no, I'm thirsty. I'm chalishing for God. I have no water. I'm, I'm, I'm looking. But at the same time, I'm realizing, I'm realizing that in the state is Yehuda, is Yud K Vav K. Yehuda is Yud K Vav K. Because when we are all in a desert and we're searching for God and we have no connection and there's no water to drink, guess what? You're actually experiencing God in a new way, in a way you didn't know about before. That's all. All we have now is a special relationship with God. So you didn't know about the relationship. Brand new relationship. Celebrate the moment. Celebrate the ability to find God in new ways. And that's the Midbar Yehuda. But you know, in order to get there, so the Rabbi Shmuel Munkas was lucky. He had uh, a Balatanya with him. What do you do if you don't have a Rebbe with you? What, what then? 
How do you find yourself for connection? So the answer is, the answer lies in the study of Torah. When a person studies Torah in general, he gets, he gets connected to something higher. But specifically, in order to overcome this kind of period of time is Hasidic teachings. I, I tell you, at this, this past over Pesach, I was studying Likute Torah of the Balatanya. It, is, it, is, it puts you in a completely different zone. When you study Hasidic teachings, you get into a totally different zone. You just, you, you feel, you see this midbar, this desert that we're in now, and you realize what the desert is truly about. You realize that this desert is really just a place where we can discover God in new ways. And in fact, you know something? Water tastes best when you're thirsty. If you're not thirsty, you don't appreciate water. And the Pasuk says, when you're thirsty, go out and search water. What does it mean, search water? If you're thirsty, if you're looking for God and you're chalishi, if you're thirsty, the water tastes a lot better. And when we're looking for God in the state that we're in now, all it means is that the water tastes a lot better than it ever did before. That Judaism now tastes a lot better. And so our avoida now actually calls us to a much deeper level than we were in before. It's interesting that um, when the Yamsuf split, when the Red Sea split, so it says the Medrash, pretty well-known Medrash, it says that all the waters in the sea split at the same time as the Red Sea. Not only the Yamsuf split, but all waters in the world split. So that, that appears to be a wonderful, incredible miracle. I mean, it's amazing. If, so all the waters in the world split, that means that, means that the, the miracle was so great that you felt it everywhere. If you were sitting in, in the Pacific Ocean and didn't have any access to the, to, the, to the Red Sea, so you wouldn't know about it. Now you knew about it. If you're drinking a cup of water and, and minding your own business somewhere in Siberia, you knew that the Jews were crossing the Red Sea. But if you think about it, it also means the opposite. Because it also means that everyone now had the ability to deny that the miracle was a miracle. Obviously, there must have been naysayers and people who would not recognize the miracle. And they would say, eh, who believes in it? It didn't even happen in the first place. It wasn't a miracle. So if the water would have split only in the Yam Suf, then it would have been clear that the purpose was to allow the Jews to pass by. But since the water split everywhere in the world, now you could argue that the goal was not to get Am Yisrael passed, but rather it was just a fluke. And all the water split, and the Jews happened to be crossing at the time that all the water split. Do you see how there's two ways to explain everything? Always, there are always two paths open to you. Even in the moment when there were open miracles, when it was as clear as you get. And the Mechilt is trying to, to, to explain how great the miracle was. But at that time, at that time, there were those who said, there were those who came up and said, you know what? It's not a real miracle. It's not a real miracle. It's just a fluke at the water split. So Corona comes about and some people say, yeah, that's not a godly thing. It just happened to be some virus in China and decided to flow out and whatever. It just happened to be here. And who knows? But as Jews, we know, as Yeshayahu Anobi puts it, the prophet Yeshayahu says, Anoichi asisi eret the Adam barasi. I created this earth and I put man on it and barasi, the word barasi, I created, is the same gematra numerical value as tar yag. It's the 613 mitzvahs. And the Pasuk says, Rashi says, for two, the first Rashi in the Torah says, for two, the world was created, for the Jews and for Torah. And everything in this world happens for the Jews and for Torah and for your ability to be able to do Tayag mitzvahs. You want to know why they're the Chinese? It's not the Chinese that made the virus, basically. Don't tell this to anyone. The virus is all because of the Jews. It's always because of Am Yisrael and because of how Am Yisrael reacts and what Am Yisrael does as a result. And it's all, it's up to us. Depends how we decide to behave at this time. And what that means is all the waters in the world are split. The whole world got Corona. It's not just us that got it. The Muslims also can't go to uh, Lahavdil to their mosques. And uh, the Catholics, the Havdil, are not able to go to their church. So what does it mean? The Jews special, not special to the Jews. But as Jews, we know that it's absolutely special to the Jews. The Yamsuf split for the Jews. 
And even though all the waters in the world split at the same time, but the Yam Suf split for the sake of Am Yisrael and the recognition that the Jews had that it happens for us and for the sake of the Jews is what allows us to go and to act accordingly and to wake up and to say, okay, Hebra, God wants a relationship with us. He wants a beautiful brand new relationship with us. And that's our ability to go and bring that out now. And so, and so we're able to celebrate with a simcha, with a happiness that we never knew about before. The simcha that's going to be in the time of Mashiach is a simcha that we can experience now, today, right away. Why should we wait for Mashiach to be able to get the simcha? We can actually have the simcha, this happiness, this rejoicing right now. Because we know the reality. We know the truth of what's really behind it all. We know this whole thing was designed. Bishvil Yisrael, Bishvil Hatayra. And so never before in history has there been a time of a calling and a yearning for God like there is now. That, um, you know, it says that uh, um, it's going to come a time when, when, when there's going to be a summer. Not a, not a hunger for bread, not a thirst for water. All we want is to hear the word of God. Do you realize how this wonderful corona, which was created for the sake of the Jews and for Am Yisrael and for Terah, brought us to a yearning for God. And if you don't feel that yearning, or if you're wondering as you're feeling that yearning and you're saying, not with me, sit down and say a capital to Hillim and dive into Hashem and say, Almighty God, let me in. All I want is to be in with you. I want to be in. in. I want to experience a relationship with you. I don't want to go back to shul just to go back to shul. I want to go back to a state of Mashiach. I want to go back to a state where I can experience a relationship with God. And that's called Mashiach. And that simcha is the ultimate simcha. That's what it says about the times of Mashiach. You'll go out with happiness. The mountains will sing with you. They are these huge mountains in our lives. They look like the most difficult experiences that we ever have. But when you have a simcha and you know and you're yearning for God, then the mountains are going to sing with you. All your difficulties, all your mountains that have been so tough, all your challenges in life, you're going to realize... All of them were all designed for one thing and one thing only, to get you into a deeper relationship with your own self, to get you into a deeper relationship with God and to discover God like you've never had a relationship ever before. And I want to end off with one part over here. And when we sit down to the Seder, we say, Seder is all about Amuna. The Seder, the beginning of Pesach, is all about, you sit down, you have a carbon Pesach, and we did, we took the, the Egyptian carbon and we took the, this lamb and we tied him to the bed and then we shechted him and we slaughtered him. And then we sat down, as the Pasuk says, Masnechem Chagurim, your, your loins were good and you were ready. Naalechem Beraglechem, your shoes on your feet and Makelchem Beyedchem, and your stick was in your hand, your staff in your hand, and you're ready to go. And you eat it in haste. And if that was at the beginning of Pesach, then at the end of Pesach, at the end of time, we are now in the most glorious moment ever known to mankind. History has been waiting for us. We think we're just little guys. These little guys that we are, history has been waiting for us. And the same as they sat down by the Seder, look what they did by the Seder. Whatever they did then is exactly what we need to do today. What do we need to do? We need to take the carbon Pesach and Shechtim. The God of the Egyptians, we got to Shechtim. Yesterday, we worshipped money. Yesterday, we worshipped honor and prestige and how many people looked at us. And it was a prestige to have thousands of people at your wedding and thousands of people chas at a funeral. And now, all you want is just to be able to do the thing itself, the mitzvah itself of getting married or getting the opposite. And all we want is to escape the avoid the Zara of Mitzrayim. We are not servants of the idol of America we are halalu Hashem. We are servants of God. And when they looked at them in Kriyas Yamsuf, the angel said, halalu halalu What exactly is the difference between a Jew and a non-Jew? But we know that there's a difference. 
The difference is we're going to tie the God of the Egyptians to our bed. That's what we're doing now with our Corona situation. We're realizing, tying ourselves to this realization that it's just the God and letting go. And we take Mosnechem Miraglechem. Mosnechem. What's Mosnechem? Mosnechem is the core of who you are. At the core of a Jew is Emuna. And we gird ourselves with Emuna. Right? Mosnechem Chagurim. What's Mosnechem Chagurim? You put on. You put on emuna. You envelop yourself. You you base yourself on emuna, because emuna is the core foundation of everything who we are. And when a Jew has emuna in Hashem, emuna in Mashiach, he knows this is different to what's ever been. And then you put on naalechem beraglechem. You put shoes, shoes on your feet. What does it mean? Shoes on your feet. The shoes that we wear. What are shoes? Shoes made of leather. Leather is made of animal. We all have that goisha animal inside of us that craves and yearns and drives us mad on the sugar. Well, let's turn him into a shoe. Let's fashion the animal into hide that can be utilized as we tread through our lives. Because our lives, the life of a Jew is a holy life. We are not regular human beings. We are treading on a path towards discovering a relationship with God, towards manifesting the power of God in this world. And when we, number one, get rid of the idol of the Egyptians, tie him to the bed, realize it's not about money. There's something deeper. There's something much deeper which makes a Jew in his relationship with God. And we gird ourselves, our we put a muna at the core of our lives. We turn to God. We say, God, help me with my amuna. An imamin. I believe I have a muna in the Abish. I have a muna in God. An imamin. I have that amuna. That's the foundation of who I am. That amuna. And when I have that amuna, and then I look at my life, na'aleichem beragleichem. I put shoes on my feet. What are the shoes? The shoes are taking animal hide. All my animalistic experiences, when you have a muna, they all get channeled into an excitement over God. And he who used to be angry yesterday suddenly becomes excited about God. He who used to be depressed suddenly realizes a meek, beautiful, tame relationship with God. Every fiber of what we are can be utilized in our service with God. Umakelchem beyedchem is the final one. And you take your stick in your hand and you say to the Yetzihara, you say to get rid of the Yetzihara. You get rid of any sign of Yetzihara that we have. And you eat, eat the power of Emunah. And if we take something out of this Pesach, which we've just been through, what is Pesach? What did we just go through? We went through an experience of Emunah. And if the experience of Emunah is taken into us and we're going to take it through us into the next step, then what we want is to walk out of Pesach saying, God, I have Emunah in you. I believe in you more than ever. I feel connected to you more than ever. I feel attached to you more than ever. I realize my life is really a life of Emuna, and that's what I want. So now what I want to do is sing one more nigan, the Balatanya's nigan, and then afterwards we're going to open to discussion to whoever wants to open the discussion. We're going to sing the actual nigan of the Balatanya because it's Zoom, so without the preparation, just the actual nigan designed for special, unique times like Mashiach Suda as we're in now. And by the way, I read the four cups of wine, so if you have any grape juice, take some, make a lechaim. Here we go. If you didn't have Arab Akoisis, that's not a Muba Shalayu Chaliska, and you can still fix it up. Lachaim and Lebracha, Lachaim Yidin, Lachaim Chaver, that we should experience a Muna. We should experience what it truly means to be a Jew, dedicated, connected, hoisted up. And when you are, your life is a completely different kind of a life. Lachaim. Are you ready? If you can, sing where you are. Yeah, 
Okay, now the floor is open. Feel free. No, who wants to inspire us a little bit? Mati Schwender, maybe? I, 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 I read the Fabrengen that you were referring to over the last two days. Yeah. And uh, the, the story of Rav Shmuel Munk is actually told to my children. Uh, but the way you put it in together with, uh, with the corona, it was uh, very, ma making the, the story very real, not the story of Sita Shemais from 250 years ago. Uh, thank you for sharing that um, component. Yeah. No. How was Yamsev? Baruch Hashem. Uh, definitely different. It's the first time I was home. Baruch Hashem married for 17 years, 17 Pesachs, and it's the first time I'm home. So, Baruch Hashem. No. So, what's one part about the Muna you spoke about over Yamsev? And put me on the spot like that. <laughs> No, but like uh, by the end of the Mashiach Suda, so after the Dalit crisis, so there was a little bit of matzah left on the table. So I told my children, this is the last piece of the, just the eating of it brings the amuna. Everybody took another bite out of it. Yeah. The, uh, the Rebbe Maharaj says, uh, you know, that um, that eating matzah is basically... What's the word he uses? Eating when you eat matzah on the first night, but even over the course of all eight days, even when matzah is rishus, it's you're eating literally elokus. You're eating a piece of godliness by eating the matzah. The only food that is directly from God, and you're actually eating the matzah itself. Me'est get lechait. So yeah, no, Doctor Jacobs, maybe you had something uh, inspiring. A very nice fag. Very, very nice fact. I'm in uh I'm in Miami. Oh I, I missed I missed the first I missed most of this year because I was in the middle of my Mishir Suda. Which you I made started. a Mashir Suda? I made a Mashir Suda with four cups. I'm on my third cup. I have uh some I have herring, I have fish over here. Good, finish all four. This is my uh I'll, I'll probably get to five, but God willing soon, right? We know what five means. Abdullah. What? Don't forget Abdullah. I did Abdullah too. That was number uh, one and a half. But uh, basically, I sat in my first Mashiach Suda about three and a half, about three years ago in Tel Aviv with my good friend Eli Nadich, who's a shliach in Tel Aviv. Um, so it keeps getting better and better each year. It feels like we're getting closer and closer to uh, the Gola Hashlema. Um, and we've just been doing, I think with this coronavirus, it's a sad situation, but it's also something that we could turn to a uh, positive insight because we get to really take a step back and see, hey, what are we pursuing in our life? Where are we going? Why are we doing what we we're doing? And uh, what's our ultimate objective? So when we read in the first few, first two days of uh, the Chag about... Uh, Yetzia Mitzrayim and, and we read Magi and, and, and the plagues and everything like that and we understand that there's a procession, there's a Seder. Hey, you muted yourself, Chaim. Chaim, you muted yourself. We can't hear you. Where Time you disappeared. Challenges of technology.
Beautiful. Page 320. Please turn to page 320. All right. Well, look. Oh boy, everyone's got to everyone's got to say for but me. Oh well. <laughs> repeat, repeat that story. Huh. Don't worry, Gabe. You're not the only one. I don't have one either. Is it true that the Rebbe huh. was a scientist who is building uh, uh, missiles for the Russians? That he himself was also very into technology and the future and. But he did it. Uh, he did it in, uh, at a very high level. Gashmius, I heard uh, at yeshiva. It was uh, yeah. that the, the Rebbe built missiles. That I don't know about. But he was an engineer. Uh, okay, he was an engineer. Oh, yeah. But Mati's referring to a story that he says of here that the the Mizricha Magid had a son. His name was Rabbi Rama Malach, and he once um, he once told his he was on on the wagon drive, and he goes to the wagon driver and he says to him. He's sending him off the wagon driver. So he says, he was teaching him how to be a wagon driver. So he says, you got to smack, you got to hit the, the, the horses until either until they know they're horses or until they stop being horses. <laughs> and that's like what we want to get to. To transform ourselves, to get to an animamim, to a place of connection to the Yebishter. Yeah. Rabbi, I'm a third. <laughs> 